Thank you. you. may be seated. Thank you, praise team, for leading us this morning. This powerful times of worship. Aren't you grateful for God's amazing grace this morning? That he would lay down his life for us. And we didn't deserve it, church, did we? We didn't deserve it at all, but he did it for us this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you take and turn to Acts chapter 5? Acts chapter 5, we are closing in on the end of our series of this section of Acts, Men of Courage. We've been looking together for the last several uh, weeks together and then before that point earlier in the year about this incredible passages of Scripture as we work through the book of Acts together. And really stopping this morning and thinking about, as we have seen already, great displays of courage, great displays of conviction, and really these next few messages together will be no different. But I want to ask you this question this morning, are you and I living a life that demands an explanation of why we live the way we do, of why we talk the way we do, of why we value what we do, why we share what we do? When we pray this morning, we will be people that would be forced for others to wonder, how how did they walk through that? How did they get through that? How did they deal with that change in their life? How did they deal with those circumstances? Because I know them and they couldn't do that by themselves. That we live in such a fashion that somebody has to come up to us and say, hey, you've got to explain yourself. What is different about you? What what allows you to live the way you live and and do the things that you do? Not that we're perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we live in such a way that somebody says, you've got to stop and tell me right now what is the secret of your life. We would live in such a fashion that that would be the case. These apostles were living that same way. I pray this would be a core conviction that we would understand that each of us, God has given us influence. God has given you students influence in your school for a reason. God has given you influence. Children, in your school, God has given you influence. Moms and dads, in your jobs and in your homes and in your neighborhood, God has given you influence. And here's why He's given you influence. Not because He couldn't think of anything that's better to do or to give it to somebody else. He gave it to you so that you and I could have a deep abiding impact on those around us, specifically those that fall under your influence in your shadow of your life. And all of those are unique for us, and some of those may cross paths, and some of those may be the same for us, but there are some that are unique just to you. And the question is this, what kind of impact are we having? Anybody think in just a moment, this graffiti slogan, what what, what might you think is the all-time most popular graffiti slogan of all time? Anybody think of what it might be? Somebody yell it out to me, what might it be? I love you. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's not what I'm looking for. That's a good one. Somebody else. Peace. That's a good one. The peace sign. That's a good one. Anybody else bold? This is audience participation. Huh? Anarchy. Interesting. All right. That's a good one. That's, that's the one. I've seen that before too. Yep. Here's the one I think might, I might propose to you. You ready for this one? Because some of you, when I, when, I, when I do this, I'm going to watch your faces. I was... Oh, why are you laughing? You know what that tells me? That you've written that somewhere, carved that somewhere, left that somewhere. I can remember in a cabin in Soaring Hawk Camp in outside in Missouri, deep in the woods, in a cabin somewhere. My name is written in toothpaste on that cabin. I was here. Brad Eubank. Maybe you've gone to a restaurant. We went to a restaurant at Gulf Shores this last year. I don't know, what, what's the name of that restaurant? I have no idea. It's across from Tacky Jack's. That's a pretty, pretty appropriate name, Tacky. Because all over the tape, all over the room, if you've been there before, you get a piece of masking tape and you put your name and the date, the time you're there. And so all throughout this restaurant screams, I was here. Which makes us stop for a moment and think this question. Why is it the most popular statement, I was here? Here's what I believe. That God has put innately inside of each and every person that is in this room and every person that lives on planet earth, God has put an innate desire inside of us to live in such a way that people know I 
I was here, that my life made a difference, that I had an impact, that when I leave this place, somebody will be sad that I've left it because I've left an impact. That my life will go far beyond the days that I go to glory in heaven if you're a Christ follower. That it will live far beyond me. That I was here. Not for our glory, not for our credit, not for our, our, our confidence or for who we are, but simply because God designed us to live in such a way that we leave an impact that I was here. And I'll be honest, I'm at that stage of life, and some of you can relate, and some of you can't. Some of you are like, good night, you're not that old. Some of you would say, good night, I've thought about that myself, and others of you thought about that 20 years ago. But I'm in that stage of life, I'm 44 years old, I've been in the ministry over 25 years. And I began to calculate for some reason, I guess you hit this stage in life, Miss Barbara, where you begin to think in your mind somewhere, listen, I have lived probably, and I hope I have a long ministry. I, don't, I won't be preaching when I'm 80, I don't think. Maybe I will, I don't know. I'd be, I don't know, I'd be interested to preach at 80. Can you see that already? I'm going to tell you, church, I'm going to do it until I can't do it anymore. But I've probably got about 25 years plus left. In other words, here's my thought process. I've only lived out the first half of my ministry. And so I've asked myself this question, where have I left in my life the statement, I was here? Now, granted, I will give it to you. Typically, when I walk into a building or a place, unfortunately, most people know that I was there. Why are you laughing? That is not funny. Because I'm loud. I, typically, my wife tells me I'm much louder than I realize. I think it's because my hearing is not that good. Um, I'm just loud by nature. I don't mean that. What I mean is this. Are there people along that path who would say that Brad Eubank has left an indelible impression and influence and impact on my life? That's, that's, that's a sobering thought if you just stop and let that in for a moment. Some of you are at this stage of life, by the way, right now. And you look back and you think, what if I left? But here's the good news. God willing, as long as he leaves you here, the question can still be answered. The statement can still be made that I was here. So the question is, how can we write with our lives and not on a billboard or on a bridge or on the roof of a building somewhere, how can we write, I was here? And here's the thought that came across me, and I read this scripture, you'll get it. And that, and that is this, is to consider the shadow of your lives. To consider the, the shadow that we are casting, and who is in our shadow, and what difference can we make for those who are in our shadow, of what they see and hear and watch in us. I want us to see this morning and think about that as we read this context of the shadow of the lives, in particular of these 12 men, but also the other followers of Christ. What shadow did they leave and what difference did it make in the lives of those around them? We will see how the gospel affected their lives and get this, it should affect our lives in the same way as well. And at the very end, I'm going to ask some challenging questions on the back side of your outline. I want to ask some challenging questions for you to stop and consider this morning about your shadow. Let's look at the reading of Scripture. I invite you to stand the honor of reading God's Word. This is a lengthy passage of Scripture, but I want to read every word because every word is important. We were in chapter 6, by the way, last week. We're going back to chapter 5 to pick it up and finish up the rest of chapter 5 this morning. Look in verse number 12, and it says this. And at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, people held them in high esteem. Let me stop just really quickly. In case you weren't here two weeks ago, this is the backdrop of Ananias and Sapphira. It's just occurred. These two folks have died. God has taken them out over the purity of the church. And people had heard about it. You talk about talking town at the beauty part of Buddy. It was burning up. Jacks and Hardys and whatever else that was happening. I mean, it was the Monday morning conversation. Did you hear what happened at First Jerusalem Baptist Church yesterday? These folks didn't give with a pure heart. God struck them dead. Verse 14. And all the more, 
believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number to such an extent that, the, that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any of them. And also the people came from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all being healed. But the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But an angel of the Lord during the night opened the gates of the prison, taking them out and said, Go hide and run. No. Okay, just make sure y'all were listening, right? Go your way, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. And upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now get the humor here. Now when the high priest and associates had come, they called the council together, even all the sentence of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. In other words, the meeting's already happening, Right? But the officers who came did not find them in prison. They returned and said, We found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors. But when we had opened it up, we found no one inside. And when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about this as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported this in the middle of this conversation. Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Man, wouldn't you love just to be able to see that picture? Now, there's a lot of pictures in your Bible. Back in the day, you had little pictures they drew in your Bible. I never saw a picture of that one. But let me just tell you what I think it might look like. Something like this. What? Right? And so, watch what happens. Verse 26. And the captain went along, and the officers and priests proceeded to bring them back without violence. In other words, guys, do y'all mind coming with us? Lest they should be stoned, they were afraid of the people. Verse 27, and when they had brought them, they stood them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are His witnesses of these things. And it is, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and were intending to slay them right there. But a certain Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to this, listen to these words. Men of Israel, take care of what you propose to do with these men for some. And he gives some examples of two guys who had had some issues and they had gone away. Verse 38. And so in this present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action should be of men, it will be overthrown, as the other two were. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may be found fighting against God. Wow. And they took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them to speak no more in the name of Jesus, and then released them. And so they went on their way from the presence of the council, saddened, heartbroken, devastated. Just making sure you're paying attention. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy. Worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day, not just Sunday, every day, in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Father God, speak to us. Application to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Maybe we see it. Take that outline quickly, if you will. And let's follow along together. Again, if you have an app on your phone or your iPad, you can follow along as well. The notes there in your worship guide as well. I want you to do a couple things about how this plays out. The purity and the power of the gospel displayed in their lives. We're going to see about this shadow. And the first part of their shadow was the purity and the power of the gospels displayed in their mind. The people were in awe of what God was doing to these apostles. They could not believe what God had started in their lives. They were absolutely flabbergasted what God had done. They had no explanation for it. They were trying to figure it out. They were trying to know, what should I do? They didn't know. They, didn't, they were confused. 
But they were in awe of what God was doing. So we see some questions right out of the gate about what they saw in these people. Number one, do they see the purity of our lives in the same way they saw in the disciples? Can they sense that we are passionately in love with Jesus and that that love is supreme above everything else? Do they see that we love the sinner but hate the sin? Do they see that we are holy people? Are people around us in awe as they were in that day of what they see God doing in your life and in your family? Are people in awe of what they see God doing here at Petal First Baptist Church? Do they see that we are different, that what we say is how we live, that we claim that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord? They see that and, and does our life back up, our lives back up that statement? Is it reflected by how we spend our time, our talents, and our treasures, or is ours the same as the world? Do they see the power of God on display in you and me and in our church? Do they sense and can they see that we are sold out followers of Jesus Christ, willing to do whatever it takes to see Christ rule and reign in our lives? That we are living out of an overflow of what God's power is doing in and through us and how He is purifying us. Do they hold you and me in high esteem in our church? And here's the statement that is difficult. Too often, I'm afraid, instead of making an impact on culture and society, the church is ignored and treated as of no account. It's a great statement to stop and ask ourselves, why does a lost world blow by these doors? I had to go run this morning quickly. I don't normally do anything on Sunday. I had to return something and exchange it for something else at Lowe's. Man, you thought, you thought it was Saturday morning. They were piling there, buying every kind of thing you could imagine. And they weren't going to church. I, was, I promise you, I was the only one dressed in Sunday clothes. There's a lot of big T-shirts, you know, big T-shirts with guys, big T-shirts, looking around going, what am I going to buy? I'm going to buy this, I'm going to buy that. Walmart, it's, it's, it's not full yet because it's early still, right, for most folks at Walmart. How can they walk by, drive by this building, and we have no impact it would appear? Here's why. First, it's because they see no need for it in their lives. Secondly, do they see, and I would ask this question, do they see a difference in their lives and our lives? So in other words, do they see a need that there is something missing in their lives that they need? These early followers of Christ were living in such a way, these people that were watching and observing and seeing what was happening saw a difference in them. They saw their purity. They saw their power of the gospel. I already asked it a moment ago, but let me ask it again. Thinking about this, people know what God is doing here. If we close the doors, would they notice? Would anybody say, what happened at First Baptist? Man, we're missing this in our lives because of the ministry that's being fulfilled. And I would say, yes, we would. Is it to the extent we want it to be yet? No. But we're on that process. We need to be constantly asking who is in the shadow of our steeple and what difference are we making for those who fall under that shadow? And in my opinion, our shadow falls for the entire pedal community. Not only for those who live right around this building, but our responsibility goes far beyond that. And by the way, our shadow goes even further than that because our commission is not just for pedal. It's to the, all the way to the ends of the earth, isn't it? So isn't it cool to stop and think about that the shadow of our steeple today, what time is it in Indonesia back there? Is that 11? 12, 15, is that right? 12, 20? Your watch is too fast. Who said that? Too fast. Give me four more minutes, Tony. Give me four more minutes. I, I can't have that. So it's 12, 16. It, it's 12, 12, 18, or 12, 19 in Indonesia. Thank you, Tony. It, 12, 20 at night. Teresa, you got over that jet lag yet? You kind of got back on the real, real daytime, right? So they're sleeping over in Indonesia. Our steeple cast a shadow and Sangal and Sakada. Now, 99.7% of us have never stepped foot on Indonesia soil, and 99.1% of you probably never will. But your influence is casting a shadow over there. Isn't that awesome? And not only that, our shadow goes further because we're part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Our shadow is cast all over, literally all over the world on a daily basis. What shadow is cast in ours? Oh, there's so much to be said here. here. Here's the challenge. I think sometimes, why do we have little impact? I think sometimes we as believers, if we're not careful, we get full of the things of the world too easily and quickly. 
It's kind of like this. When I graduated from high school, my commitment, my mom made us eat healthy. We always had to eat dessert if we got it last and only if we made what? A happy plate, right? Right? I heard that statement. You know, there's starving children dying and you're leaving all these leftovers so you ain't having Jack Dilly's spot. Look at the smiles. All of y'all had that same conversation I did, right? I do it with my kids. We pass it down generation to generation, right? So when I got to college, I made a commitment to myself. I made a commitment. If I want to have dessert first, I will. Because I am an officially an adult. And so the first week at the cafeteria, I walk in, and I'm like, wow. I mean, look at this. I mean, there's desserts. They're not one. There's like multiple desserts in this cafeteria. And so I went the first thing. I didn't bother going to get the roast and the vegetables. Man, I went and got the dessert. And I called my mom, and I said, Mama, I had dessert for lunch today. You did not. I did. I got full up with dessert. I didn't eat Jack Lily Squad of the regular food. I got strawberry pie and chocolate pudding and banana pudding and chest pie and strawberry. I don't know what all I had, but it was good. Only problem was, by the time I got through, I was full. Too often in our world, we get full of what we think, right? And we know at the end of the day, desserts are going to do nothing else. What it's done to me and give me a lot of extra weight in my gut. That's what it's going to do for you. But when it tastes so good and it's the best stuff, it tastes a whole lot better. Though I love peas and green beans, I promise you it tastes a whole lot better than broccoli and cauliflower. Right? Oh, don't like it. So what do I do? I eat Oreo cookies instead of broccoli and cauliflower. And it shows. <laughs> it shows, doesn't it? Some of you have been so kind and gracious to tell me. Went to see Rebecca, her, her arthritis doctor, and man, he said, Rebecca, wow, you, you weigh this much, you've lost weight, you look great. Brad, what happened? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. Right? What do we do? We, we fill ourselves with the stuff of the world and we get full. And so it's no wonder when we come to church, listen to me, this is a great illustration. It's no wonder when we come to church that we go on to things of God, that we have to be so entertained that we come in there going, wow, this is too long, or oh, that song was too short, or I don't know this, and I don't know that, and our appetite is completely full. It's no wonder we struggle to read God's Word every day and to live in the presence of God because the presence of the world has filled our lives. So we have no more room. So for some of us this morning, we need a good old emptying process. God to bring back the purity and the power of the gospel. Secondly, notice the pressure and the persecution brought on by the gospel. Notice the pressure and the persecution that was brought on by the gospel. No great surprise here. Satan takes notice more and more every day of what the church was doing. And at this point, remember, Peter and John were arrested earlier. Now the Bible tells us all 12 apostles are arrested. They're all taken and put into a public jail for proclaiming the name of Christ. One would say, well, they're really just attacking the apostles and the church. Let me tell you, that's not what they were attacking. They were afraid and they were jealous. They were afraid they were going to lose their power and their control. They were jealous of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were turning away from Judaism and turning and repenting of their sins and believing in Jesus as Savior and as Lord. And when that begins to happen, whether it's right here in America or worse, in Indonesia or Malaysia or these 10, that 1080 window in these Muslim countries, folks, people pay a price to follow Jesus. And that's what motivates this Fear and jealousy over what happens. It happened right here. They arrest them. They throw them in, in jail. But an angel comes and frees them in the middle of the night. Why does an angel do that? Why didn't he just say, why don't I just find a supernatural way to do something different? What does he want, what does he want the disciples to know? Here's what he wanted to know. I can free you anytime and anywhere at any place if I so choose. I have that kind of power, disciples. Now, lest we think that the, God delivered the apostles every time, folks, listen to me carefully. Listen, this is important. In this moment and in several other instances, we read in Scripture, and I'm sure there were others that were not recorded. We read that the angel came and caused Peter to be able to escape. We'll read it a little bit later on in Acts. But make no mistake. These disciples lived and breathed and knew that God could do that. Matthew knew it. 
when he suffered martyrdom by the sword. Mark, when he died in Alexandria after being dragged through the streets of the city. Luke, Dr. Luke, who wrote Acts, experienced the same when he was hung on a large olive tree in Greece. It was John's realization when he was scarred in a cauldron of boiling oil and lived his last day banished on the Isle of Patmos. It was the same with Peter who was crucified upside down in Rome. James as he was beheaded in Jerusalem. James the less when he was thrown from a high pinnacle and beaten to death with a club. Philip when he was hanged. Bartholomew when he was scourged and beaten until he died. Andrew when he was bound to a cross preached at the top of his voice until he perished. Thomas, who ran, was run through with a lance. Jude, who was killed by executioner's arrows. Matthias, who was stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas, who suffered the same fate at Salonica. And Paul, who was beheaded in Rome. Make no mistake. God is able to deliver, and He does. But this same God sometimes calls us to the place of being willing to die for our faith. Now, very few of us are ever going to be called to do that right now. Who knows where our world and our culture is heading? But I want to tell you something. The persecution Satan has brought upon America, in my opinion, is far worse than what's happening across the world. Here it is. You ready for it? Here's the persecution. Ready for it? Be quiet. Be quiet. Nobody wants to hear. Nobody cares anymore. What you're going to share really doesn't matter. Your family's saved. You go to a good church. You're good. It's subtle. It's quiet. And we are at ease inside. And the Holy Spirit's call to us and my calling as your shepherd is to make that seat in which you sit uncomfortable with the fact that thousands of people in Petal, Mississippi and millions of people in the state of, Mississi state of Mississippi and hundreds of millions in North America and billions around the world are perishing without the gospel. And it must burden our souls. It must. And be willing to give up whatever it takes to do what the angel told the disciples. Go and proclaim the life. What do you find when you follow Jesus? You find life. You find joy. You find peace. You find purpose. You find meaning. You find satisfaction. You find comfort. You find peace. You find Jesus, which is life. And the promise of life everlasting. The angel says, go back to the same spot you were preaching and share the life of Jesus. We just read a moment ago, the council says, go find them. They can't find them. And I love what they said. You have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. The Bible tells us here in this early part of chapter 5 here, what has happened? People from around Jerusalem began to come out of the outlying villages. Bethlehem, Capernaum, sections of Galilee, these small towns. They began to come to Jerusalem because they want to see what's happening. They heard about it. Wouldn't it be great for us wouldn't it be great for us to hear this statement? Good night. The churches of Petal have filled this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me try that one more time. I, I don't think I even... Is my microphone... Can y'all hear me? Am I, am I, wouldn't it be great if in our city that it would be said that our churches, not just our church, but all the churches in such a way that the gospel is being proclaimed throughout our city. So that one day Walmart and Lowe's would have to close on Sunday because there's nobody there because they're in church. Oh, well, preacher, that's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous vision. You're right. It probably is on the surface. But let's just be real and honest. There are always going to be lost people. But here's the question. There ought to be very few if we're doing our job. You're like, wow, preacher, ease up a little bit. It's the truth. Notice the fourth thing, or third. Their perseverance and bold proclamation of the gospel. Verse 29 to 32, we see their perseverance. They go right up and they're bold. They share the gospel. They don't, they don't water down the story. They don't say, well, okay, listen, we'll kind of ease up a little bit. We won't quite, no, no, no. They tell them again, we've got to obey God rather than you. And this same Jesus whom you crucified, who you disgraced, 
according to Deuteronomy, by, by him hanging on a tree. God has exalted him and blessed him and given him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven, on earth, and on the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Prince and He is the Savior. And if you will repent, Pharisees and Sadducees, you too can have this life. They're bold. They persevere. They don't stop. They don't listen to the intimidation, which our world would tell us. I'm so thrilled to see some of these people that are being intimidated into to caving into our culture. They, they, that couple in, in Seattle, Washington, that was forced to pay this $130,000, $40,000 fine for refusing to, to make that wedding cake for that couple. They paid the fine. We're not going to compromise the gospel, whatever it costs. Perseverance and bold proclamation of the gospel must happen. Notice this next one. The proposal, the prevention, and the promise of the gospel. The Bible says when they're sharing the gospel, and you may find this to be true in your life sometimes, they were cut to the quick. I mean, they were so mad. This word literally means they were sawn in two. How do we put it in perspective? They were ticked off. They were furious. They were mad. They were so mad. They want to grab them right then and there. And listen, we're going to find out in just another chapter that at some point that is going to change. But Gamaliel, this guy who was well-respected, he was an important, influential leader in the Jewish times. He had a school of Pharisees to teach Jewish law. And he stands up and says, guys, wait a minute, let's settle down just a minute. Sends them out and says what we already read. Remember these other two guys, they rose up. And, the, and, and quickly, within a few years, they were completely crushed. It was not of God. And he makes a great statement. We don't know if, if Gamaliel was really considering the gospel at this point. Maybe he was. I would probably think more than likely he wanted to kind of push it down the line. But he makes a great statement, and the statement is true. If it is not of God, then it will go away. If it is of God, then you will be careful because if you oppose it, you'll be standing against God himself. And it will continue to last if it's of God. What prophetic words, weren't they? We stand in testimony of Gamaliel's words 2,000 years later. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We hear in our culture, oh, the church is dying. Oh, there's more lost people than ever. And we've talked about some of those things, and it is true. But listen to me carefully. Jesus' words were as true then as they are now. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. They bring to them this proposal. Well, let's, here's what we'll do. Just leave them alone. They're going to try to prevent it from spreading. But yet we see the promise of the gospel. Notice the last statement here. The perspective, the purpose, and passion that the gospel brings. I love these statements. And they kept right on teaching and preaching. The Bible tells us here they were flogged. We have no reason to believe they didn't receive a typical flogging, which, by the way, was this. Their shirt, their tunic was ripped off. They were bare-chested. They were whipped two times for every one time. They were whipped on their chest and on their back. It was meant to inflict harm. It was meant to inflict punishment. It was meant to do something to be a, uh, 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 to hopefully get them to not do it again. But more than that, it was designed to put scars on a person to remind them that I better not do this again. But instead, for these disciples, it did the exact opposite because what did they consider? They considered it an honor to carry, as Paul calls, the the wounds of our Savior on our body. The wounds of Jesus who was beaten almost to death, scourged, not whipped, but scourged. There was a difference. And they walk out of that place rejoicing. Can you imagine the report that came back to that Sanhedrin and Pharisees and Gamaliel? Can you imagine? These guys walk out rejoicing. How will we walk out of jail? How will we walk out of jail if we do this beaten half to death? We consider it an honor to accept this honor in the name of Jesus. powerful statement here's what we know they shared their lives on Sunday and Monday 
the gospel. I didn't just share it on Sunday and come and sing and sing a song and hear a sermon and go out and say, yeah, man, I need to do something different and walk out unchanged. No, it changed them radically. The Bible says they went about it every single day. So here's our question. Are we living that faith every single day? Are we being radically transformed by the gospel? I encourage you maybe sometime this year you would do it this way. Find somebody in your job, in your neighborhood, somewhere, a friend, students, and take them to lunch over the next year 10 times. Take them to lunch. And begin to build a relationship with this person. Maybe you know them, maybe you don't know them very well. And begin to find out about their life. And listen, the first meeting, don't say when the waiter puts down the bread, oh, wow, there is the bread of life. And your water, he's the living water, okay? Cheesy, okay, let's not just weird people out, okay, with the gospel. That's not what we're talking about, right? We want to invest in them and listen to them and hear their story. And over time, earn the opportunity to speak truth into their lives. Because here's what we know about our lives it's rare we're ever going to go a year without having a difficult moment in our lives in a year. And if you've lived this whole last 2015 with no difficult moments, would you come see me? Because we'd like to help you write a book on how to do it. And in those moments when you build a relationship, you then speak the truth of the gospel and how it has changed your life. And share the gospel. It's easy to do it on Sunday, but it's hard to do sometimes on Monday. So let's talk about the shadow of your life. Would you turn over to that back side of your outline? I want us to consider these questions this morning. We don't have time to go through every one of these or for you to write them down. But I want you to stop and consider this moment. Let's talk about a shadow for a moment. Boy, Emma has been really, really amazed by shadows lately. We were playing with her this week, and this Friday. I think we were taking a walk and looking at our shadows. And she was just mesmerized. Like, this is the coolest thing ever, right? Little kids, you know what that's like. But here's what we know about a shadow. We, this is not rocket science here. Some great science lessons. So science teachers, Karen Fordham and others, you'll be so impressed with my science knowledge. Here, here's what I know about shadows. You, you have to have a source of light to create a shadow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very smart. I, I, I'm a science major. Wife, are you so proud of me? Science, scientist that you are? Okay, great. So I figured that part out. It's taken me a long time, but I finally figured out where my shadow came from, right? And here's the thing. Think about some shadows. Sometimes shadows are long. Sometimes they're distorted, sometimes they're short. But I know this, I got to know where my shadow comes from. And the problem comes when we live in an artificial shadow. Because right now, I have, an, I have a shadow behind me, but it's artificial. There's like three of me behind me, and there's only one of me right here, the best I can tell. But there's shadows, it's not real. When the sun, S-U-N, or the sun, S-O-N, puts a shadow, the shadow when the sun is at just the right angle recreates the perfect shadow. Early in the morning, your shadow will be shorter. Later in the evening, your shadow will be longer. Our call as believers is to stand in the Son of God at just the right angle. How do we do that? I'm going to stand in a certain way, act a certain way, raise my hands, don't raise my hands. What, what, how do I do that? Here's how you do that. You constantly bask and live and breathe in the presence of Jesus. And the more we face our lives towards the sun, the more our shadow reflects who Jesus really is. I'm praying this week, every single time you see your shadow, you stop and think. For some of you this morning, you, and that's the first question not even on here, to leave the statement I was here in the world, you've never come to a place where you have allowed the Son of God to create the shadow, the perfect shadow of His Son in you. The next question there, I'm going to come, we'll get to him. Um, here, here it is. Do, do, I, I, well, the question I asked, do I have a shadow at all? Do you have those shadow questions? Are they on the outline there? Hopefully they're there. Do I, do I even have a shadow at all? The first question on your outline, though, is where does my shadow come from? You've got to answer that question. Is it from Jesus or is it from the world? The second question on your outline is this, is who is the influence, who is in the influence of your shadow? I want you to identify who is in the influence of your shadow. Is it your neighbor? Is it a coworker? Is it a family member? Is it your children? 
You know, one of the questions I want to ask my children is, is this. What kind of shadow does daddy cast in your life? Not the shadow of up here. Because guess what? This shadow does not count for my kids. It counts for you. It just has to. This doesn't count for them because they see the real shadow. Sometimes the dark shadow, right? They see that. But what is my shadow telling them? What is my shadow telling you? Who will walk and take the place of your shadow? Well, I'm, I'm thinking this question, okay? I'm getting this as I get older. I wish I'd have gotten it 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, but we're younger, we don't think about it. Who's going to take my place? I don't mean here at Petal First Baptist, I mean just in life. Who am I investing in such a way and discipling them and investing in my life in them that the statement will be said, I was here. What will your shadow leave behind? He's really asking this question as we close this morning. Here, here it is. Who will honor you when you die? A lot is said about who honors you. Will they be godly people? People that you've made a difference in their life who will come. And I'll never forget it. I stood in, in the line for my dad's funeral several years ago. And, and I met people I had never met before. I'd heard some of their names before. Some of them I never knew. Widow after widow coming through to my dad. My dad was a certified public accountant and said this. Your dad did not, when my husband died, I don't know what I would have done about your dad. Ever since the day my husband died, he did my taxes for free every single year. He helped me balance my checkbook. I mean, crud, I didn't even balance my checkbook. And I'm his son. And he balanced these widows' checkbook. Person after person came, came through that diamond. And it makes me stop and think. What he said about me? Well... He was loud. He was long-winded. He talked so fast, I only got 27% of what he said. What would he say? I was here. And lastly, what will be said about the shadow of Petal First Baptist for the next generation to come? What will be said? What will they live under? Students that you are this age, my children that are 12. and So fast forward 30 years from now. I'll be a pedal pusher. I'll be in the senior adult ministry. Ronnie and Eva, some of you are going to be long gone rejoicing in heaven. What are you going to lead to them? What will they inherit? Will it be a church that is still alive and thriving and growing? One that is continuing to see the shadow that's left behind them and they do the same to the next generation. Listen to me carefully. You can sit in this building and say to yourself, well, that's not really my job. I'm not, I'm not a preacher. I'm not really that great of a Christian. So that's what it's somebody else's job. Listen to me. That is Satan's greatest lie. Every person who claims to be a Christ follower and part of this fellowship it is your calling. Your shadow. Went to Disney World last year and had a wonderful privilege to go back. I'd not been in decades. Had some new rides. Some I had never been to. When I last time I went, there was Magic Kingdom and Epcot, and that was, that was it. That's all there was. Didn't have this place called Universal Studios. Now, there's all kinds of rides at Disney World. You've ridden them. There's these really great rides, like the train and the, the, the shows, really great rides. Safe. But there are other kind of rides. Yeah, some of you like those rides. Roller coasters, right? Ones that go, you go backwards and upside down and in the dark. We rode, perhaps, what became my favorite ride. Now, of course, as a dad, you have to be macho, macho when you ride these rides, Right? Got to get your boys to ride. We went on this wonderful ride. Some of you will know the Tower of Terror. Now, I had ridden a ride similar, I thought, in Six Flags years and years ago over Georgia. And it read with, rode with a neighbor of mine, a very sweet, southern belle kind of lady, who we got on this ride. She convinced me to go. I was in the seventh grade. And I got on this ride. It was just a free fall. You just came down this cart. It's 
you know, put you over. You sat there a minute and boom, down you go, you know. And I heard this sweet Southern Belle, part of our church family, utter only half of a curse word because she couldn't get the rest out as we started down the line. I won't repeat what that was, but it started with S and ended with T. And so, but she get the T out and it was just down the, oh, down it went, you know. So I wasn't scared because I was laughing at her. I'm like, what did she just say? And so down, down she went and down we went, well, I was terrified. Boy, we got on tired of here now. Here's the deal. If you've been on this ride before, I don't want to ruin it for you, but man, I mean, they, it make you wait for a year and a half to ride the ride, okay? So the anticipation is building constantly, right? You know, you get on the ride, you go out, they put you in, the little spooky people, oh, the elevator's broken, blah, 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 you know? Okay, whatever. This is all cheesy. You get on the ride. Oh, it's cheese factor until you get on the ride, okay? Now, it is terrifying because they do two things. Number one, they disorient you and put you in the dark, right? Well, you can't see anything in the dark, right? And I'm over, and I'm, I'm over all the little ghosts and all the little spooky stories. I'm, I'm good with that. But son, when they, and then they, then they, all of a sudden, as you're riding, they will let the windows open momentarily to completely disorient you. And what I love about the ride was as you're going up and down and back up again, there's that moment, you know what I'm talking about, where all of a sudden, if you're poor little Matthew, you're hiney because he's sitting with daddy whose legs and stomach are a little bigger than his. His little hiney is off of the seat. Are you with me? Okay. That moment of, whoo, you know, and everybody goes, well, ah, oh, you can't scream coming down because it just sucks your breath out of you, right, you know? And I, I love these people going to be like superheroes, you know, got their hands in the air, and before it's all over, everybody's down like this, you know, holding on for dear life, right? Up, down, up, down, you know, down you go. Then I came out of that ride, and man, my legs were kind of a little bit soft and jello, and like, that was awesome. Now, when I came out of, you know, the Little Mermaid show, I didn't come out going, that was awesome. You know why? Because it didn't kick my endorphins in. I was like, this was amazing. Here is the call. You ready for this? And I said, I know we're supposed to leave it through. Here, listen to this. Some of you are so content to live your Christian life in the Little Mermaid show and the train that goes around Disney World when the God of the universe has called you to get on this awesome, bloody, scary journey called the Tower of Terror. But there is no terror. Because I know who controls the ride. And I want to challenge each and every one. Listen, I'm going to look right here and we're through. Listen to me. Some of you have lived your entire Christian life in the safe part, in the part that I can control, and I will give what I want to give and do it when I want to do it, and you're living in the safe zone. And that's all you're ever going to get of Jesus. And I want to tell you something. Jesus wants to offer you far more and far greater of a ride of this life. I don't want my ride to be my children to say to them, I was here. Way to go, Disney Choo Choo Trade. I want the ride of my life to be and then to see. That there are terrifying moments in this life. And there are times when we have our hands up in the air like we just don't care because life is great. But there's going to be a moment when that bottom falls out from under you. And here's my question. What are you going to hang on to? What are you going to hang on to? Your shadow. What will it leave behind? Let's pray.